Thank you so much. Uh, for those of you, there's new faces every week. Um, for those of you who have not been part of the past two weeks, we're, uh, we're looking at a book in the New Testament of your Bibles. It's uh, towards the very end, uh, the book of 1 John. And we've been looking at uh, three recurring words that appear in this book. Uh, we looked at light last week. First week we looked at life. And uh, as we've been singing, we've been reminded of what we're looking at today, which is the love that uh, John comes to a climax in his uh, book talking about. And uh, on the screen behind me, you will see three distinct passages in that book where he is talking extensively about this love. We don't have the time to look at all of them, but we will be dipping into what they say just in a moment. And for those of you who want to follow with notes or give you some extra notes, then use your camera pointed at the QR code and you'll be able to download the notes of the outline and additional notes as well. But there's one verse that serves as a springboard for what I want to look at with you today, and it's chapter 3 and verse 1, which simply says, see what kind of love the Father has given us. There are different kinds of life. Eternal life was one of them we looked at two weeks ago. But just as there are different kinds of life, there are different kinds of love. And uh, John is referring to a different kind of love in his letter. I want to think of its origin, and I want us to recognize that it is originated in heaven because the original word that he uses, that we in English translate as kind of, kind, uh, literally is a term that uh, could be translated out of this world. In other words, what John's trying to grasp at is that the kind of love that he's describing is something that doesn't originate here on earth. It's something that is supernatural, something that actually originates with God in heaven. If I were to randomly go around the high street and interview people and ask them what they associate with the word love, I guarantee that the majority of people today would associate something emotional, something maybe romantic, certainly something that's more to do with feeling than with fact. And we looked two weeks ago at how this book is bringing feelings and facts together. Uh, and John is trying to swing the pendulum back here towards fact. And the reason for that is that the the Greek word that was commonly used for love was a word called eros, from which we get various English words that emanate from it. And it was even used by uh, the philosopher Plato to describe our attraction to God. And many of the mystery religions of Greece at the time uh, use that word in describing a kind of religious ecstasy that people were seeking. And I said to you in the introduction to this book that one of the problems in the church to which John was writing was that there were people who were saying that all that really counts is our emotional attachment to God, the feeling that we can attach to God. And that is not to be denied. We've felt much as we've worshipped this morning. But what John's trying to say is that Love is not just a feeling. And he's trying to rectify this false notion of mystical feeling that is the love that we're seeking and that we will never understand God's love until we have that feeling. And John's saying, no, it's more than that. The American psychologist Rollo May researched the phenomenon of people's search today for mystical experience. And he concluded that much of it emanates from society's 
obsession with that Greek word eros. Certainly the case in John's day and a quick flick through your newspaper or your TV channels will probably confirm that the same thing is in evidence today. So when we come to this word, it is a word that's unique to the Bible. It's a word that uh, you've probably come across before, agape. And if you look in this book, 37 times in this short letter, John uses that word for the love he's trying to describe. Put in your notes if you download them or you get them later, um, a quote from a man called St. John of the Cross. And what basically he was saying, he was a great mystic of the day, but he was saying that all visions and mystical experience of, of God is secondary to the more advanced, as he described, as acts of humility, which are the fruit of agape love, which neither values nor seeks itself, but which thinks well not of self, but of others. Someone has said that eros has to do with taking, whereas agape has to do with giving. So when we come to this pinnacle passage, and if you've got your Bible, you might want to turn to it in chapter 4 of this book. There are two occasions when, God, when uh, John describes God, and he describes him succinctly in three words. Verse 8 of chapter 4, verse 16 of chapter 4, this is simply what John says about God. He says, God is love. Not, not that God has love. But God is love. God is the very definition of love. His very essence is love. And it's an out-of-this-world kind of love. Now, we've got to be careful here. Because I can just hear people saying, oh, well, if, if God is a God of love, that means he could never punish anyone he could ever condemn anyone. He could ever invent any place like hell because God is love. But you see, we always need to balance things in Scripture. And we need to remember that two, uh, last week we looked at the statement that God is light. And the Bible also says that God is a consuming fire. So yes, God is love, God is light, God's a consuming fire. And we put all that together and we get a full picture of what God is like. Alistair Begg said this, he says, God who is love is also light and is also fire. So far from condoning sin, his love has found a way to expose it because he is light and to consume it because he is fire, without destroying the sinner, because he is love. And that's what makes this word we're looking at so significant, because a God of intense purity, with laser-like light, and who is a, a consuming fire, is the origin of, of a kind of love that is able to pick up the broken and the wounded and the unlovely and the sinners that all of us are and is able to find a way where he is able to embrace us rather than repel us because of our sin. That's the kind of love that God is trying to in part, and that John is trying to describe. So if you've got your Bible and we turn to chapter 4, we find uh, the pinnacle passage here of John describing this aspect of love. And we see that it's not only been originated in heaven, but it's been manifested on earth. So verse 9 just captures the essence of this passage in this the love of God was made manifest amongst us. Any of you in the congregation who speak or study Spanish or Portuguese, I need to tell you that the word that he uses there, manifest, is the word that's translated in Spanish or Portuguese, farol, which means 
lighthouse. And basically what the word captures is that vision of a lighthouse in the darkness shedding out its light into the darkness. The light shines of the darkness, John says, and the darkness has not overcome it. So that's what he's trying to use as an image of God manifesting into the darkness of humanity, into the darkness of this world, a unique kind of love. And Isaiah in the Old Testament uh, talks prophetically about when that light was going to be switched on on earth. We often read it at Christmas time and we can think about it as we come towards Christmas. Isaiah says that the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And what Isaiah, without realizing it, is prophetically anticipating is the incarnation of Jesus where in the birth of Christ, what's happening is that into the darkness of a world of sin, God is shining a light. God is manifesting a unique kind of love. And John now pinpoints two ways in which we've seen that uh, light manifest like a light in the darkness. And the verses that contain uh, the first of these two points are verses 9, 10, and 14. And what John is saying is that in the sending of Jesus, God is shining that light. Let me just read those three verses. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Verse 10, in this is love. Not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son. And then verse 14, the third time. If somebody's writing this uh, three times, it's important. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Could you imagine what fathers in the Ukraine and in Russia and in Israel and in Palestine are going through right now? Some of them are sending their sons and their daughters into battle, knowing that they may never ever see them again. They have to send them. But God chose to send his only son. Jesus says, or John says rather, that the reason that he did that wasn't because he had to, but because he wanted to, because he loved us. And the expression of the love that defines God is exemplified and seen, is demonstrated, is manifested in the sending of Jesus. Just hit, hit the pause button for a minute in your mind and reflect on that. Uh, we often think about the attitude of Jesus in coming but we seldom think about the attitude of the Father in sending. That sending was, was a practical manifestation of this kind of love. He didn't just say that he loved us. He did something. He took the initiative. He sent his Son and therein lies a, a vital lesson that I think John is trying to, to portray to us, that love is not just a word or a feeling, that love is an action. We don't need to feel it, but we need to do it. I wonder if putting it in practical terms, in order to understand this kind of love, we need to demonstrate it by, by doing what God did. Maybe, maybe just in practical terms, we need to send somebody right now a text message or a card when we get home or a bunch of flowers or make them a cake or knock on our neighbor's door and give them a plant. Why am I saying this? Because you see, until we do something, 
We can say as much as we want that we love people. But this kind of love is the kind of love that needs to be manifest, needs to be seen. In this, the love of God was made manifest, that God sent his only son into the world. And then John goes on to say that, secondly, it was by the sacrifice of Jesus that we, we saw that manifestation in this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be, and here's a big word, propitiation or atoning sacrifice for our sins. We, can't, we can never disassociate Bethlehem from Calvary. The purpose of the incarnation was to enable the crucifixion as a tangible, historical, and irrefutable manifestation of God's love. And it's ironic, isn't it? Or contradictory, that the, the act of, of intense hatred of Jesus being put up on a cross was at the, at the exact time of that hatred of humanity, the supreme manifestation of the love of God for the universe. And God is love. He doesn't just say that he loves us. He shows that he loves us. And if you've never done so, then this morning I want to encourage you to come to that, that place, that cross, that crossroads, that crossroads of Christianity. Because at the crossroads of Christianity, what we see and what we, we see exemplified to us is where the consuming fire of God's justice meets the cleansing river of God's love. I was sitting upstairs yesterday morning at the Global Action Prayer Meeting, and during the prayer time, I was just looking up at the cross on the wall up in the prayer room, and it just struck me that there's the vertical and there's horizontal. There's the vertical of God's justice and judgment coming down on Jesus where he took upon himself the sins of the world. He took our punishment for us. But there's the horizontal where his arms outstretched are embracing humanity, justice and love coming together. And as he embraces humanity, he wants to embrace you. I just want to ask you if you have ever come to the point of receiving that embrace. It sometimes takes, takes courage to receive love as well as give it. And some of us are, are too proud to, to actually receive that embrace we keep ourselves at a distance God wants to embrace us God wants to love us God wants us to, to sense that we are part of his family knowing God's love has been manifested on earth is not enough and that's why as we come to the end of this passage we see that thirdly John tells us that that love is perfected with us. And let me just try and explain some of these difficult verses by this. Is love perfected with us? Another translation says it, it reach its, reaches its peak or it re reaches its fulfillment with us. It's the word that uh, James uses when he says that Abraham's faith and actions worked together and his faith was made perfect through his actions. It's the word that John uses in chapter 2, verse 5, where he says, whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. In other words, you can say that you have faith, and you can say that you trust God, and you can say that you have love, and that you love God, but it remains only words until there are actions or obedience is added to it. 
As John tries to to describe this, he shows us two ways in which this love now can be perfected and experienced by us. He says, first of all, it's by living without fear. And this wonderful verse, verse 18, says, and we sang about it in our worship time, that there's no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. For fear is to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. When I first read this, I felt as if it was out of place. So why introduce the thought of fear when you're talking about love? But as I considered the context of the rest of the letter, it made sense. Remember I said to you that one of the reasons John wrote this letter because he knew that there were people in this congregation or these congregations that, that were doubting that they had salvation. They were living with doubts that they would go to heaven. And he was writing in order to assure them, to reassure them that if they believed in Jesus, they could be certain, they could be assured that they are part of God's family. Verse 17, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. And so as I read this, I understood what John's trying to do. He's trying to say that if you're living with fear, if you're living with trepidation, if you're living with uncertainty, if you're living thinking that one day I'm going to die and I'm not quite sure how that's going to turn out for me because I know that I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of God and I'm not sure whether I've done enough to, to be accepted into heaven and you're living with that sense of fear. What John's trying to say is that no, there's something wrong there. You haven't reached a full understanding of what God's love's about. Because when you understand that you're being embraced at the cross by God's love, you're being accepted you're being received into God's family, then the love that embraces you dispels all sense of fear and trepidation at the thought of that day of judgment because you approach it knowing that you belong to the family of God and that the blood of Jesus has covered your sins and that you don't have to do any more than accept that love, repent of your sin, and you are received, and you don't need to fear the judgment. Can I ask you if you have a sense of trepidation at the thought of death, a sense of foreboding that you're going to appear before God one day, and that may be healthy because what God's doing is he, he's giving you that sense of conviction that you, you need to prepare for that day. You need to be ready to stand before God. And this morning is an opportunity for you to step into the embrace of his acceptance and his love. So that fear might be taken away. But I want to come to what I think is the pinnacle of the whole book. Because finally, getting to the heart of these verses, the second proof that God's love is perfected with us is seen by loving our brothers. And verse 20 and 21 puts it very starkly, very black and white, in true style of how John writes. He says, if anyone says... I love God, and hates his brother. He's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. It's pure logic. How do I love God? It's not by saying I love him or this morning singing I love him. It's not just by feeling I love him, but it's by showing I love him. But how do I show him I love him 
if I can't even see him? Well, I show that I love him by loving my brother who bears his image. It's clear, isn't it? How do I love God? Where is he? I love him by loving my brother and my sister who bears his image. And when John uses the term brother, please don't think he's being sexist. It's, it's a, a general term. It includes, I think he's talking about the human race, but particularly the Christian church. And as I read this, and as I close, I tell you a story to my shame. Because when I was preparing this talk, I was under a lot of time pressure. And as I was preparing it and praying about it, the phone rang. I picked up the phone, and it was someone who was asking if uh, I could urgently help them out. Uh, involved uh, picking people up and, and, and taking them somewhere. And I have to confess that my inner reaction was to sigh and think, oh, I haven't got time for this. And the Holy Spirit just hit me right between the eyes. <laughs> and he said, you're more concerned about preparing a sermon on loving your brother than living your sermon by helping them. You can substitute brother with sister or son or daughter or father or neighbor or mother or work colleague. I remember years ago visiting Pam Jewett in Mexico City and uh, going to the headquarters of the work that they did amongst street children. And that ministry is called, translated from Spanish, the Ministries of Love. And I was just thinking this week as I saw the news, wouldn't it be wonderful if the government created a ministry of love. Uh, and I have to confess, I thought that Rishi Sunak could have appointed Suella Braverman as uh, leader of it. Um, but then I thought, no, the government doesn't need to create a ministry of love because God's created a ministry of love. And that's the church. The church is God's ministry of love on earth. Uh, and, and all of us who belong to that church are ministers of love. That, that describes what our, our task is this week. To go out and be ministers of this other kind of love, a different kind of love than the kind of love that the world thinks about. I'm going to invite the musicians back up, and as they come back up, I want us just to reflect. And it may well be that just as we come to, 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 to the conclusion of our studies in this book, that what God's saying to us is that the way to respond is... This morning, not necessarily by coming to the front. The way to respond is, is not by even saying in our worship songs as we close, just saying that we love. But the way to respond is to go out of these doors with a determination that we're going to do something this week that will demonstrate that we are ministers of God's kind of love by showing that we love God by loving our brothers in the human race practically. May God bless us as we do that.